Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This webinar series, The Ecosystem of Academic Publishing, is brought to you by Crossref and IES Research. IES Research is a team that provides research publication with an engaging voice through the adaptation of the IES storyboard of Big Why, Why, What. We design visuals and animations to support your research findings, maximize the understanding of the discoveries, and share your story globally to improve research visibility and increase scholarly engagement. My name is Iris Xu, and I'm your host for the day. With us today is Vanessa Ferrest, Community Outreach Manager from Crossref. She works very closely with Crossref ambassadors around the world to bring Crossref services more closely to the publishing community by trainings and events. The topic of her sharing today will be not just identifiers, why Crossref DOIs are important. The sharing will be approximately 20 minutes and we will have the remaining time for Q&A. Please feel free to ask any questions throughout the session by simply using the Q&A toolbar located at the button center of the Zoom meeting interface. The questions will be, asked, uh, will be answered promptly. And for those uh, frequently asked questions, we will discuss that later as well. So without further ado, let me move the ground to Vanessa to share her screen and begin the session. Thank you, Iris. Um, so as Iris said, today's session is on not just identifiers, why Crossref DOIs are important. Um, so as Iris um, said, my name is Vanessa Fairhurst and I am Community Outreach Manager at Crossref. I have worked at Crossref for about three years now and I manage our ambassador program as well as our live local events. Um, both online and in person when we're able to do these again. Um, and these are events where we're able to get feedback and input from our community around the world, as well as some, give some information about our services and how to work with Crossref. With me today is Rachel Lamy. Rachel is Head of Community Outreach. She previously worked in publishing before joining Crossref in 2012. At Crossref, she's worked um, in various roles from product management to managing um, our similarity check service, and she moved over to the community outreach team in 2016. Rachel will be answering the questions in the Q&A um, chat for you, um, and then she'll be also talking um, in tomorrow's session, which is on managing your mess data. So today we'll be talking to you about what a DOI is, what it isn't, and the importance of registering comprehensive scholarly metadata to aid the discoverability of your content. So this is our mission at Crossref. Crossref makes research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. We're a not-for-profit membership organization that exists to make scholarly communications better. We work with over 16,000 member organizations around the world. We have 40 staff based in the USA, the UK, Ireland, France, and Germany. So we're quite a small team. Um, we have a 16 member board, which is a cross section of international publishers, both big and small, um, um, for profit and not for profit. Um, and we have a metadata store of now over 100 million scholarly content items. A DOI is just a start, and it's what we'll be talking about today, but we also offer a wide array of services to ensure that scholarly research metadata is registered, linked, and distributed. So today we're talking specifically about Crossref DOIs, but there are, of course, other registration agencies and other types of identifiers. For example, ORCID provides identifiers for people, whereas if you were looking to register your research data, you might assign this um, a data site DOI instead. These identifiers, um, as part of the open infrastructure ecosystem, enable dis disambiguation and links to be made between research objects, people, organizations, as well as interoperability across various scholarly services. So at Crossref, we currently support deposits for the following types of content, journals, books, book chapters, conference proceedings, reports, dissertations, standards, posted content, um, which is, we also know as preprints um, and peer reviews, 
You may register other types of content that don't fit into these categories um, and we collect some basic metadata, usually as a, a data set, if it doesn't quite fit into one of these um, existing categories. And we're hoping to provide support for additional content types in future. So a bit about the structure of a Crossref DOI. A DOI is comprised of three sections. The red part, um, is the resolver address. So each GOI is an identifier, but it is also an actionable link, which means that it's resolvable in a browser. When you click on it, it will take you to the page. The blue part is the prefix, and this is what is assigned to each member when they join Crossref, usually in the format of 10 dot and then five uh, numbers afterwards. In some journals, you may see DOIs with prefixes that only have four digits, as in this example, but they've had five digits since 2012. Some members have one publication, some have multiple, and one prefix may be used to register all of your content, even if you publish different types of content, books and journals, for example. Finally, the yellow is a suffix, and this is the part of the DOI assigned by the publisher, and it is unique to each content item. Each member has a unique publishing schedule, and this could be weekly, monthly, or yearly, and DOIs can be registered at any time. And so the total DOI routes through the resolver to point to the registered URL. We received many questions from our new members about creating a suffix for the DOIs. A DOI is an opaque identifier, and this means that it doesn't actually have any meaning in itself. So there isn't a prescribed formula you need to follow. Our best advice is that you keep your DOI suffix case um, consistent, simple, and short. Consistent, consistent and simple for easy management. You need to maintain um, a suffix pattern that's easy to maintain. Um, and short, so they don't take up too much space when they're used in citations. And I'll talk a bit more about this shortly. <coughs> a DOI suffix doesn't need to state anything about the item that it's identifying. That's all done within the, red, uh, the metadata that you register with us. When, when creating your suffix, you may use the letters A to Z and the numbers zero to nine as well as certain characters like um, hyphens and parentheses. Some members use the ISSN or the volume and issue numbers. Some use a title abbreviation. That's entirely up to you. Um, as stated, it's an opaque identifier, so it doesn't need to mean or say anything in itself. You can find more details on uh, constructing your DOIs on, in our um, education materials on our website. We will share the link to all of these slides um, after the webinars. So talking a little bit about our Crossref DOI display guidelines. So new display guidelines went into effect back in 2017. And it's very important that all our members follow these guidelines for consistency and usability. Crossref DOI should be displayed in the full URL wherever the bibliographic information about the content is displayed. HTTPS is a secure protocol, but you might see older DOIs with the older format of dx.doi.org. Members are not obligated to change the format of existing DOIs, but new DOIs should have the updated version. So once your content is registered with Crossref, users will be able to retrieve the identifiers and create links using them. Crossref DOIs must resolve to either the full text, if you provide open access, or to a landing page that you maintain. The landing page must contain the full bibliographic citation of the article so that the user can verify that they've been delivered to the correct item. The DOI displayed as a URL as per the guidelines I just mentioned and instructions on how they can access the full text. This might be through a login or a subscription, for example. Access to the full text is controlled by the publisher, but the landing page must be available um, to all readers. And here's just an example of a landing page. You can see here the DOI is displayed as a full, um, full text link as per our DOI guidelines. It has a bibliographic citation 
and at the bottom there is a way to access the full text. So I mentioned that it's good to keep your DOI short and simple for use in citations and now I'll talk a little bit more about why we do this. So reference linking means hyperlinking to Crossref DOIs when you create your citation list. Reference linking is an obligation for Crossref members and if you're a member you should be linking your reference list using DOIs where there are DOIs available. There's not always a DOI um, for every um, citation. But if you include these as a, um, a free form reference, if we find the DOI link that matches this over time, we'll create this link automatically for you. So this makes it possible for readers to follow a DOI link from a reference list um, of a published piece of work to the location of the full text document on a member's publishing platform. So this builds a network infrastructure that enhances scholarly communications on the web. Because DOI links don't break over time, the reader should always be taken to the correct page. Publishers used to sign individual agreements between each other to be able to link to each other's content, but as publishing grew, this just wasn't sustainable, and so Crossref was formed to provide a central solution. And here's an example of how that looks. So in this example from Peer J, if you hovered over the link in the reference list, you can see that the link has been made by a DOI, which is at the bottom of the screen there. So reference linking is accomplished by members and their production teams. Uh, with the assistance of authors and editors, you add links to, their reference, uh, to each of their references in their articles. You can ask your authors to add DOIs to their reference lists, or you can add this later at copy editing stage. Um, there are also a number of different ways to add DOIs to references um, by, in Crossref, um, including searching via a search engine, um, which is easy and slow. Um, you can query Crossref's API using XML, or we also have our own lookup tools as well. So back to what I said at the beginning, Crossref is not just about DOIs. When you register your content, you send us the basic citation metadata for every item that you register. Um, and this includes things like titles, authors, the publication dates, issue numbers, the ISSN, ISBN, anything that describes the content that you're registering. And this goes alongside the DOI. But we also collect non-bibliographic metadata about the items as well. And this can include the reference list, as I just talked about, funding data, ORCID IDs, uh, license data, clinical trial information, abstracts, data about relationships between items, um, information on errata or tractions and updates. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a variety of publishing practices, but we do ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. The more comprehensive your metadata is, the more likely that your content will be discovered and disseminated. And we're always adding more metadata options. And you can always email us to ask if you think we've missed anything. We ask that all the metadata you deposit be complete, accurate, and up to date. And this is why, because so many people and organizations use it. Registering your content isn't just about getting a persistent identifier for your work. It is about where your metadata goes after you register it with Crossref and how many other organizations then use that metadata to find the content that you publish. Because Crossref's metadata is standardized and machine readable, it is very useful to organizations that make your content more discoverable. Uh, and this can include services like manuscript tracking services, uh, library discovery tools, or in metrics and analytics. The uses are vast and ever-growing. So to summarize, a DOI is an opaque, persistent digital identifier. It is used to identify a unique content item and its location online. And this should be updated if and when this um, content moves. It should always be displayed as a full URL link. It should be used in citations to enable reference linking to aid discovery of content and it should be registered alongside complete, comprehensive, and up-to-date metadata. 
It's also worth noting some of the common misconceptions as well. A DOI is not an identifier of who published the content. Publishing organizations can merge or titles can be transferred to another publisher. And when this happens, the prefix of the DOI does not change. This is to maintain its persistence and ensure that links to content don't break. So whilst the prefix may align with the, with the member who published that piece of content, it's not always the case. A DOI is also not a mark of quality. Often people assume that having a DOI says something about the quality of the article or the publisher. However, this is not the case. We do not assess quality of any content, and a DOI is simply a persistent link to the location of a content item online. Similarly, it's not a way to get indexed into any specific database. It may be good practice or even a requirement um, for your work to have a DOI, but as in my previous point, a DOI is not a mark of, a qual of quality of research. And finally, a DOI is not magic, unfortunately. Your Crestcraft DOIs need to be maintained with the URLs updated if and when the content moves and updated with additional metadata when it is available. Tomorrow's webinar will cover this in more depth. We'll be talking about how to manage your metadata at Crossref, including how to make corrections and additions to your records. Um, here's some information where you can get further help and support. So we have our education curriculum, um, which has all of our support documentation um, on our website. Um, this is new and it should be much easier to follow than our previous support documentation. If you cannot find the answer to your question there, you can always email our support team, which is Isaac, um, Shane and Paul, and you can contact them at support at crossref.org. We also have a new community forum, uh, which you can find at the website there. Um, here you can post questions um, in a variety of different topics and we will get back to you, a member of the Crossref team will get back to you, or a member of the community will get back to you. You can also po uh, post questions in other languages if you want, and we can try to make sure that somebody answers you in the correct language. We're also running some Ask Me Anything webinars, um, and this is a series of webinars that we're running, and if you check out our webinars page, um, you can find out when the next of those is as well. And in those ones, our support team are there to answer any questions you might have. Um, and thank you. So I've added a link on the slide to tomorrow's webinar. It's the same time as today. And there's still some space to register at the moment. And tomorrow, Rachel will be talking more about how to manage your metadata at Crossref, including how to make corrections, updates, and how to identify gaps in your metadata records. Um, and now we're going to go on to um, answering the questions. Um, I don't know what's been coming into the Q&A, I have to confess. Um, but I think Iris and Rachel are going to provide a summary of some of the questions that have been asked and then we can answer any outstanding questions live as well. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for the sharing. Now we already see some questions coming up in the Q&A bar. Uh, but for those uh, in, who joined the session late, please enter your questions in the Q&A toolbar located at the button center of the Zoom interface. So actually we already have some oh, outstanding questions and I will just select a few that might interest most of the uh, audience here. So um, one question is that uh, should we, would having an ISBN be a requirement before we can you uh, meant cross-ref DOIs for book chapters? Um, no, I don't believe so. Uh, Rachel, could you confirm that? Do you need an um, ISBN? Yeah, um, the, it's a good question. It's, we used to require ISBNs and for the registration of books and ISSNs for the registration of journals. It's still best practice to provide those if you have them. Um, but, and we'd really strongly encourage organizations to do so, but it's not strictly required because, um, because of some changes made by the ISBN and ISSN registration agencies. Um, so, if you have one, please use it. If you don't, 
you won't be stuck. You will still be able to register book content. Thank you. Right. Another question regarding book is that uh, if the book is not showing full content, can we issue DOI for content page only? I mean, uh, it means that the uh, content only uh, can be given of DOI. I believe the question might be that uh, if the information of that book is not sufficient enough, would it be possible still a DOI can be issued? Um. I'm not sure I understand completely, but you can um, issue a DOI for a book chapter. So if you only wanted to issue a DOI for a certain section of a book, you can put in your metadata the page numbers that that relates to. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Right. Another question is regarding, uh, I think is more on the uh, journal articles, papers, because uh, one of the participants asked one of his papers was published back in 2006, but that doesn't have a DOI at that time. And uh, will that be possible to get a DOI from for that old paper? Uh, I mean, uh, I think he means that his university will not take initiative for to register DOI for old documents. Would it be possible for an individual to sign up uh, their papers for a DOI number? Unfortunately, an, an individual can't join Crossref as a member. Um, we work with organization, uh, organizations, publishing organizations. Um, so he wouldn't be able to register it as an individual. It would be the university, the content owner, that needs to register that um, with us. It is possible to register DOIs for old, older content items, and there is a reduced cost for this as well. Um, we class current content as within the last two years, and anything before that um, we class as the sort of back file content. Um, but he would need to speak to his institution about that. Right, so for institutions, is that, uh, true that any publisher or a organization can become a member and request for DOI? And what is the process? Um, yes, we do have some uh, member obligations that you need to fulfill, which you can find on our website. Um, the process is to just go to our website and there is a membership form there. You fill that in um, with your information and that goes automatically to our team and they'll get back to you with the next steps on how to join. Um, there is a fee for joining, um, and this varies depending on what your um, revenue is as an organization. Um, this starts at $275 um, US, and most of our members probably fit into that category, but as I said, this varies depending on what your revenue is for your organization. Um, and we've got a webinar as well next week about finding your way with Crossref, and part of that we will show you where on the website that you join, but it's pretty straightforward. If you just go to uh, crossref.org, you should be able to find it. Right, so it means that uh, without joining, does that mean that without joining the Crossref or before joining uh, Crossref for DOIs, is that possible to register the content? No, you do need to join Crossref to be able to register your content with us um, because that is how we assign you with a prefix. Um, and yes, that's what you need to do. Um, your content needs to have both the metadata and the DOI to be registered with us. Right, so um, another question is, do all journals have to be in index in Crossref? I, what are the advantages if indexed? Because I think that uh, comes from a quite from a question of the journal uh, publisher. So what's the benefits of joining in Crossref and get indexed by Crossref? Okay. I guess that's the question, yeah. So it's worth noting that we don't index any full text content. We only collect the metadata about that content. So we don't hold any uh, full text of content. Um, and as I've said, we're not an indexing service as such because we don't assess the quality of content. 
The benefits of joining is that you can register persistent identifiers that are internationally recognized for your work. And when you submit metadata about your content, this is then used by all of those organizations that I mentioned before and more than that. Um, and if you are using this, um, it is used by our uh, tens of thousands of organizations around the world. Um, so it very much helps your discoverability of content. Um, it helps to be able to do reference linking in your citation lists. And it enables you to join some other, other services as well. For example, we have a Crossmark service, um, which is free to participate in. And you can provide um, links to updates to your content, make sure that your readers are aware that your work is being maintained and updated. We have a similarity check service, which um, is a plagiarism tool. We also have services um, to do with uh, registering information about funders. And um, so we have a lot of different things that you can participate in once you become a Crossref member. Um, and it's all about just sharing your metadata, becoming part of this um, global network of scholarly infrastructure um, and, and enabling your, uh, your content to be discovered. Right. Uh, I think we still have time for some one or two questions. Uh, I see some questions that is still in the Q&A bar, which is more onto uh, more detailed information. For example, uh, is it possible to change the ODOI prefix to the new one? Uh, sorry, the, the ODOI, which is dx.doi.org to the new one, doi.org. Oh, I see. Um, no, we don't, it's not possible to change them just because we don't, we don't change DOIs because those links are already out there and being used by people. Um, so if you change part of the DOI, then those links will no longer work. Um, and the whole idea of persistently linking is that we maintain these links um, once they are registered. Um, it's not a problem. It just means that going forwards, um, your DOIs will be using the new format. Um, and that's the case for many of our publishers, publishers, particularly many of our older members. They will have lots of DOIs that have the old format, and that's okay. Right. Another question I think related to this is that, uh, for example, a journal already have a DOI address, but uh, however, they decided to change the website of the journal. So um, are they, are the publisher able to change the information in each published art, uh, articles of DOI address to update to the new address or? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's definitely um, a thing that they should do. So the DOI always needs to point to the correct location of the, um, the content item. And websites do change. Um, also, as I've mentioned, like sometimes title, titles get transferred to new publishers and are hosted on new platforms. Um, and when this happens, um, yes, you do need to send us um, a list and you can send this to our support team um, with the email addresses on the screen, feedback at crossref.org. And you can just simply send us a list of the DOIs um, and with the new locations. So in an XML file, for example, with the new URLs, and we can update that for you. Um, thank you, Vanessa, for the, um, all the questions and answers. I think we are, uh, we don't have much time left. So for those questions that are outstanding or not answered, uh, we will bring them offline and answer them uh, directly to you if you uh, have uh, you ask the questions with your name and con continually if you have more questions please feel free to get in touch by email uh, or the Crossref website so the answer so the questions will be answered so um, for those who are interested in getting a e-certificate for these uh, webinars we will issue a e-certificate to participants who joined all sections of the webinar series. So please do, do join us for the coming section, which is uh, for tomorrow's section, it is scheduled at the same time. And you have the information from the Vanessa's uh, slides. Uh, so the next section will be how to manage your metadata with Crossref presented by Rachel. So uh, please do join us. Now, thank you very much for your time and participation. 
and all the answers will be answered offline later. So until tomorrow, have a good day and please stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I will just put the link uh, before people leave. I'll put the link to tomorrow's session into the chat just so that people have that. Um, give me a moment. Uh, Um, so there you go, the link is in the chat. Thank you, Vanessa. And um, I believe this session is recorded, so uh, the link to the recording will be sent to everyone later. Yeah, that's right. We'll share yeah. the link to the recording and the slides as well. We will do this um, probably after all the sessions so that we can send this out in one email to everyone. And then if you've, if you've missed a session um, or you just want to go over uh, one of the webinars that you watch, then you can do this easily. Yeah, thank you very much again, Vanessa, for this wonderful sharing. Thank you. I'm going to end yeah. the webinar now. Talk to you tomorrow. Yeah, bye. Bye, everyone.